so we got us a geothermal here. This is a uh, pretty good sized unit. We got four loops, basically, is what this thing does to keep the uh, garage area uh, warm through concrete floor. And then we got our recovery tank here. So, what we're doing is we got a compressor here that's acting up. It's uh, running, but it's not pumping. So, they're doing a lot of work outside, so let me go ahead and get this door off here. Alright, so here's our compressors. Um, basically, it's not wanting to pump uh, the way it should. The amperage I had prior to on previous checks was around 41 to 37 amps. Now I believe it was around 16 amps area. I tried reversing it. I tried changing the phasing. None of it made a difference. Um, charge is fine. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get this thing recovered and we're going to get this thing changed out. Um, this thing is capable of running in both modes, but because it is water to water, generally you don't cool the floor, so it's never going to run in that mode. So we're going to go ahead and get this thing recovered. Okay, well, I can probably weasel this thing out, but I'm going to have to weasel it back in when it's all said and done. So we're going to make use of my uh, little lift. All right, once again, I forgot my freaking bracket. I keep forgetting I need both of those L channels. One in the receiver and one on the pipe so that I can get a 90 degree bracket off of that. So, say the least, it made it work. Not probably the best thing in the world, but it did work. So I got it out of the way so I can get my recovery machine and stuff out. We'll go ahead and get started. doing it off the liquid line slash discharge line you can feel it definitely coming through cold you can say it's shaking every now and again so you know it's pulling liquid you can hear the machine kind of chugging a little bit how long it can go before it starts tripping limit. If it starts tripping, I may have to pull out my cooler. This is about 14 pounds, 15 pounds, something like that. Got to change the uh, liquid dryer on this thing too. Uh, this thing's never going to run in the reverse mode, so it's just a standard uh, direction dryer. Uh, so we got that in there. That's going to go in here on top. And uh, Got to get that uh, replaced, but it should be a fairly uh, easy one to get done. Everything's right in the front. It's convenient. And I think the main thing I'll have to do is undo the uh, connection here on the reversing valve. One of these fittings right here. Plus there, we'll have to remove our pressure switch so we don't melt it. This is a... Uh, I've done one of these once before. It wasn't too bad. I've even changed that reversing valve. That was... A lot of fun. Fairly decent size reversing valve. All right, we're going to change this bleed valve here, auto bleeder. Going to valve it off there, and then obviously right there, that'll isolate it because it literally just comes out of the top, over, up, and then boom. So we're going to uh, get that changed. That was not uh, working well. So we got our new one ready to go. It's all primed up, ready to roll. Just need to get splashed here with about 15 pounds of pressure. Come on, baby. There you go. Leak a little bit. There you go. Come on. There shouldn't be that much. Come on. I guess it could be that expansion tank fight and there, see if that helps. That's the problem. Expansion tank was screwing me. There we go. Uh, this one here can be tore apart and cleaned, which would be kind of nice if you ever need to clean it up. I think they're a little bit better quality. Let's open that back up. There we go. These valves don't get exercised ever. There we go. There we 
Got that changed. Just got to label it yet. Make sure cap's loose. That'll help out a little bit. Didn't lose any pressure, which is nice. That makes it a little easier to get into the side of it. So, you get right in there. Here's your coax coil. One of them. The other one's back over in that corner there. <sighs> the uh, filter dryer and stuff's up in here. Let's get this thing uh, purged out with some nitrogen. Get this thing unbrazed. Got them labeled that there so we've got it ready to go there so I forgot my GoPro so and I don't have a tripod so this can be a little hard to record so you're just gonna have to trust me on that we're just gonna probably undo it here and down here and then slide it to the left that way I don't have to jack around with anything up in here won't be putting any heat on any of that stuff so it'll work out fine and we do have our nitrogen flowing like a river so you can uh, Feel it coming through all right so we got her out of there with my tip here it's the number 15 by uni weld 17-15 i have had nothing but problems all this tip backfire and i have made sure my acetylene and oxygen is set uh, exactly per spec a 12 on the oxygen and 10 on the acetylene after cleaning it with my brushes, and the brushes didn't do no good, so I washed it out with water, then blew it out with nitrogen after that, and it actually started to work. Um, but she, uh, I don't like it when she backfires like that. It's kind of dangerous. So anyhow, uh, got it out there. Didn't uh, take long at all. So I'm just going to yank this thing out. Like I said, we've got the nitrogen rolling there, so, so far so good. All right, so we got it out pretty much no problem. Just wiggled her out. We uh, kept the back ones loose and uh, fed that suction line up in there. I've got my vice grips there to kind of hold it so it doesn't pop out on me when I'm trying to braise it in. Alright, and this here is the fun part. Basically, it's all wrapped in all this flammable insulation. So, we're going to cut what we can cut and unbraise what we can unbraise. Gonna have to put some shields in here and get that thing removed. All right, so we went ahead and got our hot block out. We've got it wrapped completely around the valve, which went ahead and wetted it a little bit. Sometimes it's a little hard to uh, form it the way you want. So just add a little bit of water to it and uh, form it in there and wrap it all around that one side to block the heat from getting to the valve and should be okay and good to go. Otherwise, I'm going to have to put extensions in here to make up for where I cut it out at. This is not a burnout. It's just a defective compressor that's not pumping correctly. So an inefficient compressor is our issue. So we're not really too concerned with uh, cleanup or anything like that. We're just mainly wanting to do good practices. So that's what we're doing right now. So we're going to use the insurance pads. I've been using these for years. So I've got one wrapped around there. That one's wetted. This one's dry. This is going to just catch any over... Uh, over flame basically that might be out and about but we're gonna use that to isolate it all right so we was able to get in there you see the nitrogen worked and same thing over here not that I need you to verify it for me but I can't quite get in there and get the perfect light necessarily in a studio so uh, added a little bit extra water to my uh, hot block air which it did great um, so we're going to go ahead and continue purging through here with the nitrogen, get this uh, new dryer in there and we should be good to go. Okay, so now we're basically going to make sure we're on the right direction here for this dryer. So we're coming out of the hot gas discharge, it goes through here, it goes all the way back to the back, the back side is our load. So we're going to go through this coil, we're going to reject the heat into that water coil, we're going to come out of it now as a liquid then into the TXV, so our flow is going to be coming this direction. And then uh, that's the TXV for the other side there. But uh, you can kind of see what we got going on here. All right, so we got it all insulated back up, reused most of it, used foam tape for the rest of it, got it in there, and now it's time to pull a quick vacuum. All right, so we're at 122. Just started to evacuate here, so we're going to see how long this takes to get her down. This, uh, I'm pretty sure it might be about a 15 ton. So 
137k down there. Let's do some math on that real quick. It comes out to about 11.4 tons, but I wouldn't doubt it. Don't round up to maybe 15 with the efficiencies and stuff. So anyhow, like I said, we got everything changed. We're just now starting full evacuation. This uh, compressor actually has a sight glass down there, which you'll be able to see. The bubbles probably are uh, the oil boiling. Once we actually start getting a little lower, it'll probably make more of a difference. But uh, she's going down fairly quick. But, yeah, just got to finish getting that last piece of insulation on there. All we had to do is rebraze it here and there, and then at the dryer. Uh, everything else is good to go. All right, so we're back here again. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at our temperatures. So we've got our gas discharge coming off the compressor here, and we're at about 130-something, which is not real super high here. It's supposedly supposed to be going to the left, but on this one here it's going to the right, so we'll go ahead and check that one out to the left, right in that area right there, and obviously it's not, so it goes to the right, if we look at the other compressor it's actually going to the, to the left, you can see it's hot there on the left, cold on the left here, or opposite. So we've got about the same temperature going through. Let's give it a little. Okay, so we're getting our bottle prep because we're gonna recover this thing. I've called the factory multiple times and they're hiding in a cave somewhere and can't answer their phone. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, just get this thing cut out. The hot gas discharge comes off the compressor here, comes into the reversing valve. Like I said, I compared it to my other ones and the heat has been coming out on the left side. That's the easiest way for me to explain this. This one here has been going out on the left side. If you follow the piping, it comes through here, goes all the way to the back. So when you walk around to the back here, you can see right there is your reversing valve up there. You follow that pipe right here, comes up, comes into the back side here of the water coil, comes in there, you can see, boom, comes into there, the distributor, goes down, back up, down, back up, comes out up here on top, goes across to here, then through my filter dryer right here, which is what I just replaced, and I had it pointing that direction. Then it goes to the other water coil which is your source side so our load is back here so we want the hot gas to come into the load side of the coil so we're just going to repipe around it this is for the radiant heat in the floor it never is going to try to cool the floor with cold water so we are just going to get rid of that and move on down the line because the compressors new like I said my amperage before was somewhere in the 40 some amp range. I end up having like 16. The new ones at least 26, 27 amp range. And I think we've got something going on with the reversing valve. What I believe happened was it probably overheated the compressor. How the case that is, I don't know. But it was not a burnout. And uh, basically, basically at this point we're going to go ahead and just get it changed. Um, there was no way to have known that because if you listen to it, the reversing valve will switch back and forth. <clears throat> but uh, at this point we're just going to undo it and uh, get it removed. It's not necessary and uh, we'll get them back up and going. So we went ahead and got the reversing valve cut out like I said. Got that in there, just was able to get away with 190 there. Reducing fitting there, a piece of 7 eighths and a new 90 here on the uh, elbow. Um, worked for perfectly, worked perfectly. The uh, Amp draw was pretty much exactly the same as it was before. Now as it built up head pressure, it got up to around 30 amps, and it was equivalent to what the other unit was running at. But as it built up even more head pressure, they both started getting more close to what I had originally. So um, 
basically had a bad reversing valve, which I would say the recirculation of the gas, when you look at the reversing valve, it don't look that bad, but it must have been dumping on itself some, and it definitely didn't help it none. There was a lot of oil in the uh, piping here and stuff. So. All right, that's going to wrap the video up, guys. Basically, what I ended up running into was a reversing valve and a compressor that was inefficient. Uh, don't know if you caught it or not when I was describing things, but my previous amperage on the old compressor was around 16 amps as it was acting up. Prior to that, I had as high as around 41, 42 amps area. So even with the new compressor, I had 26. So I had almost a 10 amp difference in a uh, higher than what I had originally. So I would not agree with anyone that says the reversing valve was the only issue. Otherwise, it would have acted up the same way with the new compressor. Uh, they were the exact same model. Only thing different was the last three digits, which is a production thing. Otherwise, it's the same compressor. Uh, I didn't get to show it in the video, but when I did use the reversing valve and test it back and forth, it made the swish noise as it went from one side to the other. I did chop it in half and take a look inside here, or I should say I chopped it open to kind of look and see if I can move the uh, switching mechanism back and forth, which I was able to. And even in the testing that I was doing, you could hear it swish back and forth, no problem, and it sounded normal. Uh, I did that multiple times in hopes that maybe it was that. I tried even reversing the phasing of the compressor, thought maybe something weird had happened with that, but none of those things did anything to help me out. So uh, I'm pretty confident in the fact that the compressor was inefficient. Why? I'm not 100% certain. Uh, I didn't tear the compressor apart, but uh, it is what I needed to do to make the system run. I did have one setback with the uh, reversing valve being an issue, but that geothermal will never need that reversing valve anyhow, so it's gone now and it's one less thing to have to worry about. So uh, just for those new guys out there that are kind of getting new into the field, here's a reversing valve. This is kind of a little bit larger one than what you'll see in, say, a residential setting. Uh, this one here basically is the same. They're all the same. Nothing changes. Your middle is always your suction. Your opposite side here is always going to be your discharge gas. And basically all that happens is, is there's a U-bend in here that's going to shift from here to here. So it's just going to loop here to here or here to there. And then when it shifts over, it allows the gas to go on through here or to let it go through here and go around that inside there. So it's not a whole lot to them. They can be a pain in the butt to change. They can be a little difficult to diagnose sometimes if they do what this one did. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious because they don't transfer back and forth the way they should or they don't transfer at all. Basically, all it is, you have electric solenoid here that controls a valve mechanism here. It's using the discharge gas to push it this way or that way, and it relieves the differential into the suction here. That's it. Nothing much to it. So uh, that's a reversing valve, guys. They can be a pain in the butt. You don't want to overheat them. Um, but then this one here, uh, this is the second one I've had to change. Prior to this one, uh, I actually seen the Mylar plastic that helps seal it uh, was kind of coming apart. Now, what I'm wondering is this thing probably never was ran in the other mode uh, because, you know, this one here is for in floor. Now, if they were using it for, say, uh, you know, air handlers or something, I could see it being switched back and forth quite often. And that's what the other one was that I repaired or replaced was that piece had worn out from all the switching back and forth. What I kind of wonder happened here is if that's got enough of a gap, because you can hear it, that, you know, that maybe it just wasn't sealing very well and it was bleeding by, uh, you know, raising your suction up, dropping your head down, you know, that kind of all goes along with it. Uh, there, like, I, I don't know if I mentioned it in the video, but there was a lot of oil up in this piping area, a lot, uh, you know, it was laying pretty thick in there which tells me, again, we had lower flow than normal. Otherwise, it'd be coming back. I mean, it just it seemed like a lot more than what I would normally see in there. So if you guys uh, like the video and you want to see more like it, please consider subscribing. also want to remind you, on Sunday evenings at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, I'm doing live shows where I go over some of the videos and have basically a hangout time. If you guys want to hang out with us, love to see you there. But as for this video, till next time, guys, we'll catch you on the next one.